In a perfect world, insurance companies would always do the right thing. Yet in reality, the industry harbors a dirty little secret. People are giving them money for something they will never receive. What that really means is they're selling uncollectible insurance. Insurance companies rule our country. They control our banking. Look at AIG, too big to fail. They own Wall Street. They catch a virus and Wall Street has diarrhea for a week. And when interest rates fall and their investments earnings plummet, then they run to Congress and scream tort reform. Lawsuits are killing us, they scream, and those greedy trial lawyers are to blame by filing frivolous lawsuits and convincing ignorant juries to dole out obscene verdicts. But ironically, what you don't know until now is that insurance companies regularly and deliberately invite lawsuits whenever the cost and hassles for a third party claimant look to exceed all potential for recovery. Rather than just doing the right thing, too many insurers prefer to play a game of litigation chicken, a frivolous lawsuit strategy in reverse. Don't like it? Sue me. And while insurance companies play rough with consumers, they play even rougher with each other. Take the process of subrogation, for example. Here you have one insurance company making a claim against another. Rather than the sue-me response, the greetings afforded a subrogation claim usually start with a two-word expletive. Still, that does not make this game right whether played against consumers or other insurance companies. A dollar saved owing only to a claimant's sense of pragmatism and threshold for litigation is not a dollar earned in any traditional sense. It is more like a dollar stolen and it happens all the time. Today, the Insider Exclusive investigates and exposes Insurance Exposed and how investigative books like Allstate Insurance McKinsey Report published in David Bernadelli's From Good Hands to Boxing Gloves with its 12,000 PowerPoint slides exposed all states in good hands, zero sum economic game, otherwise known as all state gains, all others lose. And in the years since it began implementing McKinsey's strategy, these companies' profitability shot through the roof. For more than a decade, all state insurance companies fought to keep under wraps this smoking gun and other documents that describe how the insurer had made money by reducing payments to some policyholders. Allstate was making an average of $82 million a year in pre-tax operating income, and in 10 years after the McKinsey plan rollout began in 1995, Allstate was making an average of $2.4 billion a year in pre-tax operating income. $82 million a year to $2.4 billion a year in pre-tax operating income in just 10 years. That does not happen unless they're cheating. There's no place for that to come from unless they're underpaying claims. Similar figures can be assumed for State Farm and all the other bad faith insurance companies out there. There's no denying the facts. The proof is in the profits. And the McKinsey slides are the smoking gun. The Insider Exclusive shows you how Michael Sawaya and Dale Pugh, partners at the Sawaya Law Firm, and Mike Hodges and John Smith, leading advocates for truth in the insurance industry, are getting justice for their clients against the insurance industry, earning them the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike. They have seen many innocent, hardworking people suffer at the hands of their own insurance companies, and because of that, they are driven not only to get justice for these victims of injustice, but to make sure that all policyholders get 100% what their insurance companies promised and what they paid for, plus get it without hassle and on time. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from Denver, Colorado, at the Sawaya Law Firm. It is my great pleasure to introduce Mike Sawaya and Dale Pugh to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your firm. This firm is an everybody's firm. I've had wealthy clients. I have poor clients. I don't look at their wallet when they walk in the front door. Most of your clients don't pay any money unless you win, right? That's right. And they all want us to, to absorb them in here, to take on their problems, mm -hmm. to, to make sure they're understood from each step until it's all over with. What type of cases does your firm usually handle? We're a personal injury firm for the most part, uh, dealing with uh, victims, 
innocent victims of accidents through no mm -hmm. fault of their own. We do uh, have a greater portfolio that, in that we also work on workers' compensation cases, social security cases. We've just become involved in veterans' disability matters, which we're very proud of. And uh, we do a few other uh, things related to employment law and some minor criminal matters. Right. There are many types of practices of law. You could go to work for IBM. You could represent Fortune 500 companies. I have in the past. But you choose now to represent the little people, the yes. ordinary people, the people who are screwed over. Why? Well, I think that's where my daddy came from. And, and I came back to Denver because I wanted to be close to him. He had a truck body shop and, and he'd worked with ordinary people. I worked with my hands for 13 years in his business. I'm not interested in somebody because they're fancy and I don't want to have to kowtow or pander to somebody yeah. just because it's about the dollar bill. Our business is not about the dollar bill. Our business is about service. Right. You probably think the same way. It is, it is the regular person right. that... Um, is the one that's not served best in our justice system without attorneys like us. Today we're going to be talking about the insurance industry and some of their dirty little secrets, how they really operate, how they screw their policyholders. And in order to get a real good examination of that, we are going to bring on right now Mike Hodges, who worked for Allstate for 15 years as one of their examiners. So let's bring him on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Mike Hodges to the show. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you. Good to be here. Tell our audience a little bit about what you do and your background. Well, first of all, my background <clears throat> was 14 years in the insurance industry, uh, adjusting claims, supervising claim adjusters, and managing. And that uh, was for Allstate, wasn't that it? That was Allstate Insurance Company for 14 years uh, in Colorado, Utah, and California. And while I was with Allstate, I, uh, I went to law school, night law school, passed the bar, but just didn't go into practice. I stayed with Allstate. Uh, came back to Colorado in, uh, in 1984 and went into private practice. So I've been in private practice of law ever since 1984. Mm -hmm. So you are a practicing lawyer right now? I am a practicing lawyer, and you're, yes. And you're an expert, as Mike has told us, in uh, bad faith insurance claims. That's correct. I'd say 50% or maybe even a little more now is dedicated to consulting work with other attorneys and being retained as an expert witness. Almost everybody that I know and almost everybody that everybody knows has an accident sometime in their driving career. And they ha usually have kind of a bad experience with their insurance companies, the people that are supposedly there to protect them in case they have accidents, okay? Tell our audience, having, having been 15 years working for Wall State, um, how insurance companies really work, what were you told to do at Wall State? Well, bear in mind that <clears throat> when you're part of the insurance company and you're within the industry, uh, rubbing shoulders with people from other companies, it becomes a very institutionalized process. There's expectations that uh, are come from the top to the bottom in terms of management levels uh, of expectations of people. So you're expected to adjust claims a certain way. You're expected to uh, treat your customers a certain way. By your company. By your company, yeah. sure. So it's it's an institutionalized sort of a framework from yeah. the top management down. Right. Uh, so that's the climate. That that that's the culture. If you want to, if you want to say and that. And as an incentive, you're probably given monetary rewards for making sure the bottom line looks healthier to your company. Well, interesting. You should say that because we're seeing more and more uh, insurance companies. Uh, actually very expressly putting bonus programs into effect <clears throat> to bonus their employees yeah. uh, at every level uh, having to do with uh, with the profit of the profitability of the company and people in the claim department know how the company becomes profitable yeah. you don't pay as much on claims or you don't pay claims well tell us the philosophy of the insurance company in terms of when they don't want to play, when they don't want to pay. Well, remember, and you said it already, um, insurance is purchased by by you and I and, and all the people that, that have it and need it and should have it. Yeah. Because we don't anticipate anything's ever going to happen. Yes. Uh, you know, that's you know, you know the old saying that's that can't happen to me. Well, when it does happen, that's when the insurance company is called upon to provide what they should be doing, and that is provide a service. And what has happened over the last Oh, 15 to 20 years evolving through the insurance industry more so than even when I was a part of it is this idea that the claim department should contribute more to the profits of the company and right. not so much 
be the service end yeah. of the company. Well, speaking very directly, um, let me reinterpret the words you just said. They, the claims department wants to make sure that the claims aren't paid to find ways that they don't have to pay their clients. Is that right? In a word, yes, that's right. Okay. And so they look for ways, rather than being of service to the policyholders, they look at ways where they don't have to pay this, correct? Well, yeah, and those ways are subtle, sophisticated. What are those ways? That's what I want to know. You're, okay. in, you're a former insider. What are those ways? Well, those ways are, um, uh, th those ways, first of all, start out at the very basic level where uh, a, a group of adjusters or claim representatives may be told, if you can, if you can shave $1 off of every estimate you write, uh, to repair automobiles, that will that will lend, however, millions of dollars to the bottom line of the company. Mm -hmm. Very simple. Any adjuster is capable of shaving a dollar off of an estimate. Well, what what about five? What about ten? Uh, so that's that's the more direct, obvious. Yeah. When you uh, say shaving it off an estimate, they know what this car should cost to repair. They know, Mike. They know what it should cost to make someone better after they've been in a serious accident, right? because based on other similar cases, right? Oh, absolutely. And so based on that kind of benchmark, then they start subtracting. And what is the reaction usually from the policyholder? Policyholder doesn't know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and what happens They accept is, it. Yeah, they accept it, and the, ins and the insurance companies have relationships with body shops. Body shops know they're gonna continue to get business uh, if, they, if they work with the insurance company to do repairs for the price that the insurance company says they should be done. Mm -hmm. Does this, you've been practicing law, what, 36 years? Yes. Doesn't this disgust you? I think a lot of it is, it reminds me of criminal activity, frankly. Criminal activity, yeah, that's I, a good way of putting it. I think it, it, at least it seems to have all those benchmarks of yeah. people in conspiracy to deprive other people of their property, to take it away after they've paid for yeah, it. In other words, they were promised something. Exactly. And for some reason, it ain't being delivered. Well, and they don't tell their insureds what they're supposed to tell yeah. them. For instance, if you have an automobile and it's been it's been damaged and it's not going to be worth what it once was, and it won't be, yeah. because it has to go now into computer banks. Yeah. Everybody knows your car has been damaged. It's going to have a diminished uh, value yeah. to that vehicle. There's a claim for that. No way. one's ever discussed about what that is. No one's told. Yeah. By the way, this process of theirs is called delay, deny defend, right? Correct, yes. If you delay things long enough to somebody who needs that money to fix their car to get to work, who needs that money to pay the medical bills so they can ma be made whole and they can go back to work just to live, they're really grounding these people into the ground, aren't they? Can, yeah, very definitely can do that and it can yeah. have that effect and of course, uh, that's what that's what we see. I know Mike sees it. Uh, yeah. Is when people finally come to our office, percentage wise, it's very very few. Most people just say, "Oh, okay. Well, if that's what my insurance company says, then I'll just live with it." Yeah. But the now, worst thing we're seeing now is the insurance companies don't even call. They just leave the people out there. They have to bang on the doors, call phone numbers over and over before the, people the will come out. Policyholders. Uh, policyholders, or when someone else has caused the damage and you're waiting for them to so fix they your didn't vehicle. Return the phone calls. And they don't comply with the law. The insurance companies aren't complying with fair practices that are set yeah. place by the by the various states. I mean, it, it's gotten to the point where if they can delay it for a week, they delay it for a month, they delay paying out the money, they get the people to take less money than they should, yeah. they get people exhausted, disgusted, and they'll give up. Yeah. And, and the sad fact is that a lot of lawyers aren't ready to litigate these cases. Right. They're not ready to take it to the next step. Why is that? Because they're not trained. They need the money, too. It's gotten much more expensive. When I was the first year, first five, ten years of my practice, I did a case going all the way to court with a trial that thick. Yeah. And now you go to court with, with a, a hand truck yeah. that maybe has three boxes full. I mean, it's and, and the, the cost for experts, because the defense can hire experts. Yeah. The defense, the insurance companies can do whatever they want. They have unlimited budgets. So unless your lawyer is willing to take on that kind of burden now, and it's too much to ask a lot of lawyers if you're practicing by yourself with one paralegal. How are you going to be able to take on a great big uh, a, a bad faith claim using somebody like Mr. Hodges? It becomes very difficult and and I and I think that's one thing that needs to shift before the public is able to really regain all of its rights one of the important things of doing a show like this and we've talked about this before is 
when you're in an accident, when you are a policyholder, you really shouldn't deal with your insurance company by yourself, should you? Not anymore. Okay, it's not now, safe. Not only anymore. And I want to bring up this very important point. You represent, and you too, right? Represent plaintiffs mm -hmm. in yes. cases. You don't charge them any money. So the important point I want to make here now is if your insurance company isn't paying you, you don't have any money, there's a, there's a solution, isn't there? Go to lawyers who are experienced with dealing with insurance, bad faith insurance claims and get them on board, correct? You have to. And that's very important. How do you evaluate a claim? Do you take any claims that come in? Well, we certainly listen to them. We yeah. listen to the facts. I mean, if it's, if it's minor, if it's something that can't be helped, if, it's, if they have uh, their own responsibility that they haven't fulfilled, then we can't take the case. And it takes a, an ear of listening, uh, 30 minutes to an hour on everybody's serious case to find out, can we do something? Can Mr. Hodges help them? Can we put a case together? Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you very much for being on the show, Mike. From an insider to an advocate. That's what I like to see. It's my great privilege to introduce John Smith, who is with Raymond P. Smith and Associates. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I understand that you are an accident reconstruction engineer and a biomechanist. Biomechanist. For our audience, what does all that mean? Well, accident reconstruction is where you collect the readily available data and you apply to it the principles of math and physics and engineering. For an accident. For a collision. An accident. Right. An accident of some kind. Yeah. And from that, you can determine what did happen, and you can determine what did not happen. And sometimes in, there's a gray area in the middle that is what might have happened. So there is a science that relates to the causes of injury, correct? Correct. Define for our audience, what does that mean, the science of injury causation? Well, if you look at mechanics, that's the branch of physics that deals with the application of forces to something. And bio means life. So when we talk about biomechanics, we're talking about applying forces to something that's alive. When we apply forces to something that's alive, specifically people in traumatic events, we know that certain things are going to happen. The laws of physics are going to tell us how the people have to move, and they're going to tell us where the forces are applied. So the science of injury causation is looking at a collision, figuring out how the forces were applied, and then comparing the location of those applied forces to the diagnosed injuries, the injuries yeah. that the doctors have identified, yeah. and seeing if there's a match. Now, how is this used in the real world? Where are you using this exactly? Well, it's used in the real world by, for instance, the Department of Transportation. Uh, they have something called the National Automotive Sampling System, where they go out and look at uh, collisions people have really been in, and they take the diagnosis, and they try to understand how people are hurt. Right. Because once you understand how people are hurt, then you can look at safety devices to help protect people. Now, aren't, isn't this subject to a lot of interpretation almost by, or is there an exact science? Well, there's, it's not an exact science in the sense that you cannot tell exactly which force may have herniated a disc, as an example. Uh, we know, for instance, in a rear impact that people get herniated discs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do we know exactly which force did it? No. But we know there were forces applied to their neck and to their cervical column. And so that explains why they have a herniated disc. So your company will be brought in on to a law firm like this, where you will bring your analysis and actually determine really what happened, right? That's correct. And why right. these injuries were caused, right? Correct. Okay. Does your company have a website by any chance? Well, it does. It's rpsabiz. RPS? rpsa.biz. Okay. And we can get more information about what your company does and more information about you, correct? Yes. I want to thank you very much for being on the program. This is very useful information. Well, you're welcome. New legislation in the state of Colorado. Congratulations. That's great. Um, that's what the law is all about. That's what protecting mm -hmm. the individual is all about. When you have cases that come in, you're faced with a couple of things. Should you take it to trial? Should you settle it? How do you make that determination? Well, every case that we take, we have to expect that the potential exists that we're going to go to trial. Yeah. So it has to be worked up in a manner in which we have the information necessary to prove the case and to prove it in front of a jury. Yeah. However, it's probably better to at least make a 
<clears throat> a strong attempt to settle a case just because there are many other aspects of, the, of the, the matter that come into play, not the least of which is that our our victim is tired of the situation by yeah. the time we get to this point in time and would just as soon have it over with. Yeah, I uh, want to emphasize one thing. If you're involved with your insurance company, rather than dealing with it directly, you should go to a lawyer, correct? Why wouldn't you? Why yeah. wouldn't you find out what money. your rights are? Right. Why don't you find out how they should right. be dealing with you and find out, well, are you capable? There's some very small cases where there's no reason to have a lawyer. And you there's no anal- reason to pay a fee. And we'll tell them that. And you and, analyze anybody's cases when they walk in the door, right? And we have people who come in here and, and I have advised people that I don't believe you actually need me. Yeah. Here's what you should do. And I lay out Good. exactly what he can do for himself. Good. And I am so impressed with the passion after 35 years, 36 years, the passion that you still have for how people are getting screwed over and helping them out. And I thank both of you for being on the program. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.